you know, the Pentecost, you know, their tradition is that you got to speak in tongues. They believe you have to speak in tongues to be saved. That's not in the Bible. That is not in the Bible. There are places in the Bible where it sounds like that, but if you read the book, the whole book of where those verses are at, you see that it's not, that's not what it's talking about. See, some of us, we just read verses. We don't read the book. So when we just read verses, then we really don't know if we took the verse out of context or not. But speaking in tongues in the Pentecost church, that's the way you get saved. Well, that's their tradition, that you have to speak in tongues. Well, that's not biblical. Tongues did not die on the cross for you. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. It was his blood. It was his blood that we was able to get remission for sin because of his blood. Not because of tongues. Accept Jesus Christ, period, and you'll be saved. It's not accept Jesus Christ and. There's no and. But there are churches out there who are putting ands on it. Pentecostals, accept Jesus Christ and speak in tongues. Sorry. There's churches out there that say, accept Jesus Christ and get water baptized. See, they, they, you've got to do both of those things in order to be saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, to accept him as Savior. And that's it. Jesus Christ only. Not tongues, not water baptism, and whatever else is out there where they say, except Jesus Christ and. There is no other and. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Paul is speaking. He says, I was one of the most religious Jews of my own age in the whole country and tried as hard as I possibly could to follow all the old traditional rules of my religion. But then something happened. For even before I was born, God had chosen me to be His and called me. What a, ki what a kindness and grace. Paul said right here, man, he tried hard to keep all the traditions of his religious uh, belief, being a Jew. But what did the Lord do? See, the Lord knew that Paul would break down and accept him. See, the Lord doesn't make any of us, he doesn't make none of us accept him. When it says stuff like here, like when he says, before even I was born, the Lord knew. Yeah, the Lord knew at this time, at a certain time, Paul was going to accept Jesus Christ. So it's not like the Lord said, okay, at this time, I'm going to make Paul one of mine. No, the Lord doesn't make any of us his. Then we'd be robots. He doesn't want robots. He wants our will to be for him. He, he wants it to be our will. Okay? But Paul right here says that the traditions, that he followed the tradi traditions, and then it had to take the Lord Jesus. It had to take being born again to break those traditions that he's tried so hard to keep. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophies and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and power. So right here it is saying, you need to be rooted in the Lord. You need to receive the Jesus Christ, the Savior of us, and walk with him. And the things that you have been taught through the word, you need to hold on to. And it says, to beware, to beware that any man spoil you with, through their philosophies. We got so much philosophy out there. It would take me another tape just to teach on that. If it's not coming from the Word of God, do not accept it. The Word says, do not take the counsel of the ungodly. I went to a marriage counselor once. It's been a long time ago. And the wife and I, we were having problems. And we went to a Christian marriage counselor. At least that's what it said. Christian marriage counselor. So we went to him. We were there for about 30, 45 minutes. We walked in. He had a big old Bible. It was open in the middle. You know, I laid out on, on the table. Big old Bible so you could see. 
But for those 30 to 45 minutes, the man never said anything about the Word of God. He never mentioned the Lord Jesus. Now this counselor was in a church. He had the Bible right there. But when it came down to give his counsel, his counsel was to us was to go home, lay naked in bed for about 10 to 15 minutes and don't say anything. This is a Christian counselor. So I point that out. So when you go to someone, even if it says Christian in front of his name, that doesn't mean he's a Christian. Even if it's in the church like this one was, he was in the church. Even if it's in the church, it still doesn't mean he's Christian. Of course, I never went back to the guy. Beware. It says to beware of these people with their philosophies. You need to beware of Schuller with the big glass cathedral. His philosophy is positive thinking. Positive thinking. Show me in the Bible where the Lord says for us to live on positive thinking. He says to live on his word. That he'll order our footsteps and we follow him. Like I said, there, there's a lot of philosophies going out there that is, that is not of the Lord. And right here it says there's a lot of vain deceit. People are deceiving others for their own glory, for the tithe. They're preaching a different doctrine than what the Word says. Now, I mentioned Schuller because uh, if you study, if you read a book that's by him, he says what he believes. If you read that book, you'll see this is not a man of God because he doesn't say anything about him being born again. It's all the philosophy of positive thinking. We need to be complete in the Lord. That's what it says here. We need to be complete in Him. And the only way we're going to be complete in Him is by reading His Word. Now it also says in Second Theth- Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye received of us. Tradition here meaning the command, the Lord's commandments, not the Ten Commandments, which it can mean that also, but His commands, what He tells us in the Bible, that we walk after those traditions, those ordinances. But if we see a brother out there who is not, and right here in these verses it's talking about a brother who doesn't want to work, he doesn't want to work, he's lazy. And let me say this, also in the tape of, of marriage that I have, it talks about the role of the man. The Lord says the man will till the ground. He didn't say that the man could play Mr. Mom. Biblically, Mr. Mom is not in the Word of God. It's not in the Scriptures. The Bible says what the man has to do. He's the head of the house. That doesn't mean he's the boss of the house. The head of the house it means he is the provider. He is the spiritual guide. That's being the head of the house. He is guiding his family, his wife and his kids, to the Lord. And he's responsible for that. And the Lord said, if there's someone like that, like like being lazy and doesn't want to work, to stay away from them, to withdraw yourself from them. And that's what, and biblically, in other places, it says the same thing. If you see a brother out there and he's out in the world, and some of us call it backsliding, if he's backslid and he's back into the world, doesn't mean he's lost his salvation. Because if he's really saved, if he's really born again, he will come back to the Lord. I know because I've experienced that myself. So, if this guy is backslidden, then we need to stay away from him. The Bible says not to even eat with him. Until he repents and gets back with the Lord, we need to pray for him, but not fellowship with him. This is biblical. This is what the Word says. Now, some other traditions. In Luke chapter 11, verses 37 through 53, it talks about some traditions. And it says that Jesus was invited to dinner from the Pharisees. And and when he sat down to eat, he didn't do the Jewish customs of washing his hands. And they were surprised about this. And Jesus said to them, He said, You Pharisees wash the outside, but the inside you are still dirty and full of greed and wickedness. Now this is what the Lord said to them. Pharisees, there were another group of religious leaders. And because he didn't do the custom of the, the tradition of man, they were surprised. You know, they were surprised. So he tells them, he says, uh, you know, you wash the outside of yourself, but your inside is still dirty. 
is full of greed and wickedness. And then he calls them fools. Fools. He says, didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So he's telling these religious leaders, yeah, you want these traditions to be followed. But inside, your hearts are still wicked. And he says, woe unto you Pharisees. How you love to sit in high places to be seen of men for honor. And that's what, and all you got to do is, 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 is mainly in the Catholic Church, you see a lot of that. The priests, the bishop, the pope, they want to be seen this way. In fact, the pope needs to be born again. Any man who allows worship to him, for people to worship him, and if you watch him on the news, how these people just throw flowers to him and, and they bow down to him, they're worshiping him. And he is receiving it, he is accepting it, and this is not a man of God. Paul and Peter, men of God, in the Bible, when people came to worship them, they stepped back quickly. They stepped back and said, no, no, no. Don't even worship us. Don't even worship us. There's only one that you worship, and that's God. That's God. So we have men out there, not only in the Catholic Church, which that's the most seen, and that's the most that I see that, al that allows people to worship them. But in other churches, uh, and most of them are like non-denomination, full gospel, Pentecost churches, where they, where they do sit up front in them high chairs and, and, and receive honor from the people. They're sitting up there like they're high and mighty. The Lord, the Lord said, woe unto them. Right here it says, woe unto you Pharisees. But what he's saying, he said, woe unto anyone who's like that. The Pharisees were doing it here, and they were religious leaders. But any religious leader who does that, the Lord says, woe unto you. And this woe unto you from the Lord, I wouldn't want to be under that. So when you go to a church and you see men who sit up, who want to sit up high in honor, uh, maybe you want to stay away from them, because the chances that they're walking with the Lord are very slim. Because if they know anything about the Word of God, they would know this is not what the Lord wants. In those same verses, it says and that uh, one of the religious uh, guys there, he was an expert on his religious laws. And he said he was insulted on what Jesus said. And Jesus said, yes, yes, you should be insulted. When you go against my word and when you're leading people astray and I point it out to you and call you these things, yes, Yes, you should be insulted. Anything that goes against the Lord, woe unto you, the Lord says. He says, woe unto you, for you're exactly like your ancestors who killed the prophets long ago. Then he calls them murderers. He says, you killed the prophets, and he calls them murderers. I sent prophets and apostles to you, and you killed some of them, and, and others you chased away. He said, woe to you experts in religion, for you hide the truth from the people. How true, how true that is today. All you got to do is go to some of these churches and you'll see what I'm talking about. The Pharisees and the religious experts were furious. The, the, those verses say they were furious because of what Jesus said. And so they plotted a way, a way to keep them away from the people. That's when they, they plotted to keep them away from the people. But they were furious. Just like some of you might be getting right now listening to these tapes if, if you're still listening. You might be getting furious of what's being said. But everything I'm saying is the word, is in the Bible. These religious leaders got furious. And then they started thinking, okay, we got to keep this man away from the people. Because if the people start listening to him, what's that going to do? That's going to draw power away from them and onto the Lord. And they didn't want that. They liked the power they had. They liked the respect and the honor they were getting from the people. Because they were looking at them as being high and mighty. So they knew if they started looking at Jesus, they would lose that power. So then they started to look for a way to draw them away from the Lord. In Matthew 5.20, it says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right here, he's, the scribes and the Pharisees, these are religious leaders. He says, unless your righteousness is higher than theirs, exceeds theirs, we will not see the kingdom of heaven. If we're like them, meaning that our righteousness is just like theirs, we're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. And their righteousness is the righteousness of men, not of the Lord. We need to check ourselves out. We need to listen to the word of God, read the word of God, and check ourselves out. Are we following the tradition of men or the tradition 
of the Bible, the Word of God. Now in Matthew 23, verses 5 through 33, it talks about how the religious leaders did their works in front of men to show how good they were and how they wore the scriptures on their arm in a pocket or on their forehead. I mean, they would do that just to show, look how holy I am. I got the scriptures on my arm or on my forehead. They did that for show. And they wore long robes to be seen. Look who I am. So they could get their honor and respect in town from people. So they could be called rabbi, meaning master. When the Lord himself said, call no one rabbi, he said, don't even call him father. Does this ring a bell? Father, so and so? What did they do with these scriptures? When the Bible plainly says not to give nobody, not to call no one father, that you got one heavenly father and, that, and he's in heaven. We're talking about a spiritual leader, not your father, not your birth father. We're talking about a man spiritually called father. You only have one, and that's God. But we have a Catholic religion that says father so-and-so. I'm just pointing these out to you. It's up to you if you accept them or not. He said, he who is greater among you, let him be your servant. But instead, they want to be looked up to. They want to be looked up to. Well, in these verses, if you read these verses, you'll see that five times in these verses, he calls those religious leaders, he calls them hypocrites. He also calls them blind guides. He calls them serpents. He calls them vipers. Read the verses for yourself. See what he says about these religious leaders. And then he says to them, They appear as righteous men on the outside, but within they are full of hypocrisy. That's what I'm talking about. Men that are wolves don't look like wolves. They look like righteous men, but that's just on the outside. That's just on the outside. Now in Matthew's chapter 26, read that chapter. See who put Jesus to death. It was the religious leaders. The religious leaders, not the Romans who were who were lost people. It was the religious leader who who were always lost who were also lost also. They were religious but they were lost. They are the ones who put Jesus to death. Read Matthew twenty six. Read it for yourself. We gotta break break the tradition of men and we gotta grow in the Lord so we can see who's a wolf and who really is a man of God. Now also in the Catholic Church, in Hebrews 7.27, Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people. For this, for this he did once when he offered up himself. The Catholics, every Sunday, when they break bread and have wine, they are saying that this is Jesus' body. For real. I mean... That that bread and that wine really, for real, turns into the body of Christ. And right here in Hebrews, he said it was once. He did it once. He offered himself up once. But the Catholics do it every Sunday. Hebrews 10, verses 9 through 12. He then added, Here I am. I have come to give my life. He cancels the first system in favor of a far better one. Speaking of the law. Because we couldn't get saved under the law. Because one of the laws was following the Ten Commandments. Well, there ain't nobody been able to keep the Ten Commandments. So praise God that he came with a better way to heaven. Verse 10. Under this new plan we have been forgiven and made clean by Christ's dying for us once and for all. Under the old agreement the priests stood before the altar day after day offering sacrifices that could never take away our sins. But Christ gave himself to God for our sins as one sacrifice for all times. And then he sat down in the place of honor, the highest honor, at God's right hand. Hebrews 10.18 Now, when sins have once been forgiven, forever forgiven and forgotten, there is no need to offer more sacrifices to get rid of them. I'm reading you the word of God. I mean, that's all I can say is I'm reading the word of God here. John 19.30 When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. But right there on the cross, he said, It is finished. It was finished. 
He didn't say, okay, now we're going to do this again every Sunday. No, that was it. He said, it is finished. Now, also, on the Catholics, they got saints for everything. Statues, in which I've already shown before, they've taken the second commandment out of the Ten Commandments about statues. But they have St. Anthony. He's a saint that you pray to if you lose something. St. Jude, for hopeless people in your family, like a, someone who's a drunkard or something. St. Gerald, for pregnant women. I mean, these are all saints that the Catholics pray to. St. Blaise, if you have a sore throat or some kind of sickness. St. Christopher, for traveling. You know, show me one place in the Bible where it says to pray to any of these. Show me in the Bible where it says to pray to any of these. Like I said, they left out the second commandment in the Bible. Deuteronomy 4, verses 12 through 16. And the Lord spoke to you from the fire, and you heard his words, but didn't see him. He proclaimed the laws you must obey, the Ten Commandments, and wrote them on two stones of tablet. Yes, it was at that time that the Lord commanded me to issue the laws you must obey when you arrive to the Promised Land. But beware, you didn't see the form of God that day as he spoke to you from the fire. So do not defy yourselves by trying to make a statue of God, an idol in any form, whether of man, woman, animal, or bird. This is the scriptures is saying not to make any kind of statue, to make no kind of form of a God. Because when Moses, who got the Ten Commandments from the Lord, he didn't even see God. He didn't see God. So how can we make an image of him if we don't know what he looks like? So since we don't know what he looks like, we go ahead and make a, a Mary an image of Mary. Or we make an image of Jesus. Even that is wrong. Because we don't know what Jesus looks like. We don't know what he looks like. But we've made statues for these. Part of the reason they have statues in the church, in the Catholic Church, because it's big money. They make a lot of money off the statues. They make a lot of money. So, yeah, they took the second commandment out of the Ten Commandments because this is what they do. They have statues. And what they did was they took the Tenth Commandment, or was it the Ninth Commandment? Well, they took one of those two and broke it up into two parts. So they'd have still have Ten Commandments, where it says not to covet your neighbor's things or his wife. Well, that's one commandment, but they broke it up into two parts. Do not covet your, your, your neighbor's wife, and then it says do not covet your neighbor's things. Well, that's really just one commandment, but they broke it into two parts so they could still have the Ten Commandments. Now, on Mary, the belief of the Immaculate Conception. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know if Catholics really believe what, what, what they're saying. Immaculate Conception means that Mary was without sin. She was perfect. But the Word of God says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. That's all of us. And we all know there was only one who was without sin, and that was Jesus. But right here, they're saying, they're saying the Immaculate Conception. They, they're saying Mary was, was without sin also. That's not taught in the Bible. Luke chapter 1, 46 and 47. And Mary said, My soul doeth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Mary is calling God her Savior. So if Mary was perfect, why would she need a Savior? Only those who have sinned need a Savior. So how can Mary be a Magna Conception if she was, was uh, rejoicing in God her Savior? Think about it. First Timothy 2, five, For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. How many Catholics pray to Mary to get to God? The scripture says there is only one. One mediator between us and God, and that's Jesus Christ. Period. That's it. Believe the word or believe your religion. Baby baptism. I believe baby that baptism in the Catholic Church, I don't, I don't think it's for salvation. I believe it's just to show that the baby will grow up to be a Catholic and follow the, the beliefs of the Catholics. But there's no place in the Bible where it says to baptize babies. Jesus was in his 30s when he got baptized. I mean, they, they preached the, the, uh, the gospel, and then they said, and then they got saved. Well, babies don't understand that. So right here in the Bible, it's talking about grown people hearing the gospel getting saved and getting baptized. Baby baptism is not biblical. It's not biblical. It's not in the Bible. You repent from the way you're living. You give your life to the Lord. 
and then you get baptized. You can't understand that as a baby. Then you go and confess your sins to a man. And this man tells you to go say so many of our fathers, Hail Marys. Uh, it's not biblical. It's not biblical. Our Father, that is in the, in the uh, Bible. But that's not, the Lord didn't say this is what you pray. That was an example to show how you pray. The Lord started off by saying, Our Father who art in heaven. Us recognizing that our Father is in heaven. And then it gives us this day and, and stuff like that. But the Bible, uh, the Our Father is an example of how we should pray. It's not a poem that we should repeat when we pray at night or whatever. Pray, prayer comes from the heart. I got a, a message on prayer, a teaching on prayer. So if y'all want that, just call me. I'll send it to you. But confessing your sins to a man and you having to do that, it's not biblical. It doesn't say to do that. Purgatory is a place where you go to, they say, when you die. And if you die in the grace, you go to purgatory and pay for some of your sins, and then you go to heaven. And if you died out of grace, then you go straight to hell. That's not in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. If you die, if you die and you're a born-again Christian, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So as soon as you leave this body, as soon as you die, you, you go to be with the Lord. There is no purgatory. Now, before, before Jesus resurrected, there was a place called Sheol, or, and it was a place where uh, there was a river, and on one side of the river is where believers went to, which was called paradise. And then on the other side of the river, it was where the non-believers went to, like Solomon and Gomorrah and the people who died during the flood of Noah. People who didn't believe, that's where they went. And that river divided the two. But once Jesus resurrected, it says that he went down to prison and preached to the people there. He didn't preach to them and took them to heaven. They're still there. See, just like Jesus had to be the firstborn into heaven, nobody went to heaven until Jesus went to heaven. That's why they had paradise. They went to paradise. Then after Jesus resurrected and was in heaven, went to heaven to be with the Father, now the believers, Abraham, Lazarus, and all them, now they could go to be with the Father. But Jesus had to be the firstborn into heaven. Same thing with hell. These people who, who died, who do not know, who are not born again, and they're in a place called prison, and there's other names for it. But there's still, they will be there until Satan is put into hell fire. When Satan is put into hell, the hell fire, then those who didn't believe will go after him. But right now, they're in a place called prison. But there's no purgatory. There is no purgatory. If you ask a Catholic, you know, well, what do you have to do to make it to heaven? And the majority will answer you, because I know because I've done this. The majority will answer you and say, well, if my good outweighs my bad, I believe I'll go. Or they'll say, well, going to church, being a good person will save me. The Bible says we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. Ephesians 2.8 says, for, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So we're saved by grace. We're not saved by how good we are and if our good outweighs our bad. That's not the way you make it to heaven. Going to a church doesn't, doesn't send you to heaven. You got, you got tons of lost people going to church. They're not going to go to heaven when they die. In Titus 3.5, it says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration, in the renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's the way we get saved. Not by works of righteousness. It don't matter how good you are. I don't care if you're a person who will take your shirt off your back to help someone. If you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. Not in your mind. In your heart. If you're not a born again Christian. You are not making it. No matter how good you are. This is the word of God. Read Titus 3.5. It says it. doesn't matter how good you are. If you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. And in the Catholic Faith, there are seven steps to, to making it to heaven. They have faith. They have baby baptism. you got to be a member of the church. Follow the Ten Commandments. Believe in the sacraments. Prayer and good works. These are the seven things in the Catholic Church that you need to do to make it to heaven. Till you die. you got to do these things till you die to make it to heaven. Acts 16, 
verse 30, 31. And I brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Did he say, Be as good as you can? No. Did he say, Go to church every Sunday? No. He said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. And let me, let me get something straight on the word believe. That doesn't mean just believe, because the devil believes in God. In fact, the devil knows scriptures better than we do. Because he quoted scriptures to Jesus when he tempted him for 40 days and 40 nights. So, believing, just the word believe, this is not what he's talking about. Here, the word believe means commit. Commit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Make him Lord, and you shall be saved. Second Corinthians chapter 11, 1 through 15. Now, I'm going to read all these verses. And then I want you to read them also. Verse 1. I hope you will be patient with me. As I keep talking like a fool. To bear with me and let me say what is on my heart. I am anxious for you with deep concern of God himself. Anxious that your love should be for Christ alone. Just as a pure maiden saves her love for one man only. For the, for the one who will be her husband. But I am frightened, fearing that in some way you will be led away from your pure and simple devotion to our Lord, just as Eve was deceived by Satan in the Garden of Eden. You seem so gullible. You believe whatever anyone tells you, even if he is preaching about another Jesus than the one we preach, or a different spirit than the Holy Spirit you received, or shows you a different way to be saved, you swallow it all. Yet I don't feel that these marvelous messengers from God, as they call themselves, are any better than I am. If I am a poor speaker, at least I know what I am talking about. As I think you realize by now, for we have proven it again and again, that I do wrong and cheapen myself and make you look down on me because I have preached God's good news to you without charging you anything. Instead, I robbed other churches by talking of what they sent me and using it up while I was with you so that I could serve you without cause. And when that was gone, I was getting hungry. I still didn't ask you for anything. For the Christians from Macedonia brought me another gift. I, never, I have never asked you for one penny, and I never will. I promise this with every ounce of truth I possess, that I will tell everyone in Greece about it. Why? Because I, because I don't love you? God knows I do. But I will do it to cut out the ground from underneath the feet of those who boast that they are doing God's work in just the same way we are. God never sent those men at all. They are phonies who have fooled you into thinking they are Christ's apostles. Yet, Am I not surprised? Satan can change himself into an angel of light. So it is no wonder his servants can do it too. It seems like godly ministers. In the end, they will get every bit of punishment their wicked deeds deserve. I read these verses. I'm like, man, this is me. This is me. I love, I love people. I love for them to give their life to the Lord. And I'm not a, I'm not a, a speaker either. I mean, I, I don't use intelligent words. You know, I'm my 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 speaking, as you can hear on these tapes. I'm, I'm low. To, I'm slow to speak, and that's that's Moses was the same way. Moses told the Lord, "Hey, I'm I'm not an eloquent speaker. How how are you going to use me?" But God did, just in the same way He's using me right now. He doesn't need no fancy speaker. When I was a uh, praying about going to the seminary, going to college and stuff to be a preacher. I had one preacher tell me, well, you need to go to seminary because they'll teach you when to get loud in the service. <sighs> I'm sorry. That's of man. If I get loud, it's because the Spirit has moved me to get loud. It's not because I'm programmed to find a part in my sermon when, when I'm supposed to get loud. But right here it says that he would never charge for the Word of God. And that's me. These tapes are free. I will not charge anyone to hear the truth. The Lord says there's wolves out there. There's phonies out there. And they look like Christ's disciples, apostles. 
Please, please listen to the tapes. Please listen and read the scriptures that I've given you. Especially the fathers out there. If you're a father, you especially need to listen to this because you are responsible for your wife and your children on where they go and what they believe. You are responsible for it. But you know what? These 13 verses 55 and 56, it says Jesus was just a carpenter's son. That's all he was, was a carpenter's son. He didn't go to college. He didn't, he didn't go to schooling. He didn't have a title in front of his name or letters behind his name. But we seem to think that you have to have these things so people can respect what you say in the scriptures. Now, because my name isn't Pastor Jesse, or it's not Jesse MD or PH or whatever, all those letters they put behind guys who go to college and get all these degrees, because I don't have these in front or in back of my name. If you choose not to receive this, because I am not ordained by men, and I say by men, it's your choice. But Jesus was just a carpenter's son. John was a man who lived out in the wilderness. So it's up to you. It's up to you whether to accept this tape and the scriptures that are in it or to stay where you're at. If you are doing these things, if you are more devoted to your church, to your pastor, than you are the Word of God, and you want to make a change and you see that it's wrong, then all you have to do is right now get on your knees and repent and say, Lord, I didn't know. Now you have enlightened me. Now I see. So now I have to do something about it. And I'm choosing to follow you instead of my church, instead of my preacher. I'm talking about if they're going against what the Word of God says. And I've pointed out a lot of things that you need to be aware of. So you, it's, it's your will. The Lord has given us all a will. So it's your will to do whatever you want to do. I pray that you make the right decision. Because these are the scriptures. These are the Word of God. And I have not taken them out of context. Choose. Like the Bible says, choose you this day who you're going to follow. In Amos 3.3, 3, it says, either you're for me or you're against me. How can, how can two walk together if they be in disagreement? So how can you walk with the Lord if you're in disagreement with his words? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for giving me the words to say. I thank you for just touching me. I thank you for being my Savior. I thank you that I have believed in you and only you. And I thank you that you gave me enough understanding, enough knowledge to to know that there are wolves out there, and that that did and that through the power of the Holy Spirit, they were unable to deceive me. I pray for the people who have listened to this tape. I lift them up to you, Father God. I pray they make the right decision, and that you'll give them the strength to do whatever they need to do to get right. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. And thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross. The only way to heaven is through him. And the only way to pray to you is through him. Thank you, Lord. I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.